Blog Talk Radio. Be chiamo afura kanu afurai kaitnut. Ene ye akanto nana som da me dinde u girafo kwesi rane bata akan. Akwamuma in a maruka etikimu u girafo. U mu. Greetings to all Afurakani, Afurai, Kaitni people, meaning Africans, black people. Today is Akanfo Nana Som Day, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion day. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Radne Pata Akan, Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America, within Ojiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurai, Kaitni people in the Western Hemisphere. Did I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. We are opening up the chat room. If you have any questions or comments and you like to interact in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised so that we can interact. We have, for those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanfo Nanasom, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion on Joda Monday nights, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Nanasom, first and foremost because we are Akan, secondly because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan ancestral religion, culture, philosophy, cosmology, and so forth, put forward not only by individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but also those individuals on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraika in Africa who have been infected with Christianity, Islam, Judaism, white culture, pseudo-religion in general, and thus their presentation of our kind and such religion is infected with these pseudo-religious practices. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan and such religion, which is our ancestral religious practice born of our ancestral blood circle. Our ancestral origins are in ancient Kanat, the Khan land, first land, foremost land, which is a title of ancient Nubia. We migrated from ancient Kanat, the Khan land, 2,000 years ago after the fall of Kemet in northern Kanat, migrated to the western part of the continent, reestablished the Kanat Empire, the Empire of Ghana. Centuries later, some of our people migrated away from those regions further south because of Muslim invasions, reestablished the Kana civilization or our Kana civilization in the savannah regions and forest belt areas of today's contemporary Ghana and Ivory Coast. Centuries after that, some of our people were taken from those regions and forced into the Western Hemisphere, into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe, during the Musu Okesie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. This is how Akan people, some of us, ended up in the Western Hemisphere. However, we maintained our ancestral religious practices. Thus, the Akan tradition is called Winti in South America, in Suriname, from the Akan term Winti. It is called Obia in Jamaica, from the Akan term Obai. It is called Hudu in the United States and North America, from the Akan term, undu, which means roots, medicine from roots, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit, through spirit possession, spirit communication. That terminology is also found in the language of ancient Kanid and Kemet. Undu meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life, also meaning to become heavy with the spirit. Undu is also so the term for the ancestral and ritual altars and the ancestral offerings and deity offerings placed on the altars and so forth to give to the forces in nature that is called the Undu or the Hudu that we give to the deities and ancestral spirits. One of the titles of ancient Nubia is the Undu land and the people, the Undu people. Thus, we've been utilizing these terms for thousands of years from ancient Kana through the West Afuraka, Afuraka into North America. Because we maintained our ancestral religious practices, we were empowered and guided by the Abosom and Nananoman Samanfo, the deities and spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood circles on the best means by which to wage war against the whites and their offspring forced the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, waging war through chemical and biological warfare as well as utilizing metal armaments. 
So this is what we deal with on Akanto Nanasom. On Benada, Abinada Tuesday nights, we have Ujida, which means purification. We deal with the purification of concepts, culture, religious practices, ritual practices, not just of Akan ancestral religion, but Afurakani, Afurakani, the African ancestral religion in general. Nanasom is the term we use for ancestral religion in general. So we deal with the purification of concepts, cosmology, ritual practices, and so forth. We deal with ancestral religion, which in essence is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We state that Ojira purification operationalizes nanasong. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance. So on the Ojira broadcast, we focus on those aspects of culture, cosmology, ritual practice, and so forth, things that have been corrupted. We bring that purification of understanding so that we can execute our functioning creation in harmony with our culture. Our ancestral culture, or Amamre, is the divine law or love of order, the divine acceptance of order, the law or love of order, the divine hate or rejection of disorder and its purveyors. When we incorporate order and reject disorder, then we're able to align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day. That is our culture. When we make legitimate mistakes, then we engage the ritual process to incorporate divine law and restore divine balance so that we can get back on track with executing our function in creation and aligning every thought, intention, and action with divine order. This is how ancestry religion impacts every aspect of our lives, because we seek to uh, align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day. So on Wednesday, we have Egua Marketplace. We showcase businesses, organizations, and institutions in the Afurakani community, those who are serving the community in a positive capacity, those who maintain their ancestral religious values, which inform their service to the community. We also deal with the philosophical foundation of economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values as uh, elucidated in our publication, Okom Economic Development Model. And on Yauda, Abada, Yauda, Yada, which is Thursday, we have Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. In that broadcast, we deal with specific issues confronting us as Ojira Amain, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, recognizing what an all mind is, a nation is, a living, breathing entity governed by specific forces in nature, abosom, orisha, vodou, and so forth, like an organ being regulated by specific forces in creation, and the children of the organ are the cells which support the functions of the organ, their parent. We are cells within a larger structure, which is the all mind, the nation, and that nation is a living, breathing entity that's governed by specific forces in creation. When we as cells align ourselves with our divine function and support the function of the parent organ, the nation, then we're living in harmony with order. Because we were directed, after we were forced into the Western Hemisphere, we're directed to coalesce, blend ancestral blood circles in a certain region of the Earth Mother to bring ancestors and ancestors back into the world, interface with the earth mother divinities in this region of their body, interface with the unique expression of the Abosom, the Orisha, the Vodou in this region of the earth mother's body in the West, deal with the plant life, animal life, and mineral life from this region of the Western portion of the earth mother's body and so forth, utilizing that for food as well as medicine. That confluence of interactions causes us to forge a locative identity rooted in our ancestral function our ancestral mandate, our divine function, our divine mandate, but also operating in this region 
and incorporating the unique expression of energy in this region. We forged the locative identity, which makes us a unique group of Afurakani, Afurakani people, and we have a unique approach to expressing ourselves through our ancestral religious practices, such as Hudu and Hudu and Vodun and Wanga and Gengai and so forth, but also the way we solve our problems from an Amanie or nationist perspective. We deal with the nationism, the purification of nationalism, an approach to nation building rooted in ancestral religious values. So that's what we deal with on Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. Uh, give me one second. Hold on one second. Okay, so tonight is Joda, Monday night, Akan Donana Som, and what we're going to deal with tonight is Unu, the Abosom, the deity of the hours and synchronized life events. So first we want to post some information. Uh, if you go to our website, you'll see the link, the Etchy Sign page on our website. And when you go to that page, it'll also link you to, and we'll put that link in the chat room right quick, link you to the book, Etsy Sign and Such Religious Reversion. We have two volumes of that. We're going to draw from that publication. All right, and we just want to send one more notification out just so people, we have to post information a little bit late, so some people got the information a little bit late, so we want to make sure people see that information. All right. Okay. Now we put the information up. So, Unut, this Obosom, this divinity of the hours and synchronized life events. So we want to get into some detail. When you look at the uh, image that we use for the broadcast, what you see in, in the middle is the female abosom, the female untorot, or divinity, deity, who's called unut or unut. And you see the head, on her head she has a, a standard, and on the standard is the symbol of the hair, which is um, what we're going to be dealing with tonight. So the 15th gnome in ancient Kemet, or the 15th sepat in upper Kemet, was called the gnome or the sepat or the administrative division of monut or unut. And there are different pronunciations for this divinity. Um, as we talked about before, Kemet is divided into 42 administrative districts plus the capital, which is the 43rd central piece. But those 42 sepat or sepatu, the Greeks call them gnomes and so forth, similar to 42 states. Of course, we showed... Um, in our broadcast, Sepat, the 42 gnomes, 42 nerves, 42 days of the sacred calendar week in our Khan tradition, the 42 pairs of nerves um, is related to the 42, quote-unquote, gnomes of Sepatu in ancient Kemet and the divinity whose name is Sepat and so forth, governing those 42 sets of nerves. Um, so you have lower Kemet and upper Kemet and upper Kemet in the 15th, administrative district, the 15th sepat, or quote-unquote gnome, or quote-unquote state, so to speak, the divinity, Wonu, is a sacred divinity regulating that area, and the city of Kemenu was located in that, that's the city of the sacred Agduad, or the so-called primordial eight divinities, Amen, Amenet, Kain, Kayat, Hehu, and Hehu, Nun, and Nunet, and so forth. So, she's depicted there. Sometimes she's shown as a hare, Sometimes with the woman, with the head of a hair. Sometimes the woman, as we show in this image for the broadcast, the female divinity in the form of a woman, and on her head is the standard of the gnome or the sepat with the hair sitting on top of the standard. Now, let me pull that image back up. So we have that standard, and then we show her, and then we show an image of the um, hair rising above the water line, the wavy line in, in the Medutu, the hieroglyphs, is a quote-unquote water line, also a line dealing with energy, 
within the water and so forth, electromagnetic energy in the water, but that's what, in general, the water line and the hair is rising up out of the water line. Then we also show one of the ancient water clocks. So we're talking about hours. We're talking about synchronized life. One of the definitions of unu to wunu means existence, but it's also a name given to, that she gives to, the term for hours, certain divisions of time and certain deities, male and female divinities that govern the hours. So we're not just talking about existence in general, for example, life, for example, a physical life in the physical world, then you make your transition, then you have that existence or life or unnut existence in the ancestral realm, and then you go through the gate of birth, and then you have existence or life in the physical realm and so forth, that's existence and that's talking about time with regard to existence, but what we want to talk about is synchronized time, time that's a portion and so forth and certain events taking place within a synchronized, different things coming together in a synchronized fashion. That's the kind of time or that aspect of existence we're talking about uh, tonight with regard to this divinity. So when we look at this uh, water clock from ancient Kemet, this is dealing with time, and it's also related to synchronized time. It's talking about hours. There are deities that govern the different hours of the day, and they also, of course, lend their energy to synchronized events that take place within your life, animated by various abosome deities as well as nananoman, samanfo, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. So and if you're going to talk about synchronized events that take place in your life, quote-unquote, uncanny events or events that are synchronized by the deities and ancestral spirits. We must talk about this notion of time, existence, but the de deities that govern the hours, forces in nature that regulate order, holding of time in an apportioned fashion, which we're talking about here. So we show this ancient water clock from ancient Kemet. So we had different kinds of clocks in ancient Kemet. Two major kinds of clocks are sundials as well as water clocks, but also the tekanu. So first let's talk about the sun, using the sun to regulate time. The ancient tekanu, so-called obelisks or obelisks in ancient Kemet, the very tall, thin structures with the pyramidal uh, top. We were the first to uh, formally divide our days into parts resembling ours, the Tekkenu, so-called obelisks, slender, tapering, four-sided monuments were built as early as 5,500 years ago. And even beyond that, their moving shadows formed a kind of sundial, enabling citizens to partition the day into two parts by indicating noon. They also showed the year's longest and shortest days when the shadow at noon was the shortest or longest of the year. Later, markers were added around the base of the monument to indicate further time subdivisions. So we use these ancient tekanu. Of course, for example, in Washington, D.C., the Washington Monument is nothing more than a tekken, a so-called obelisk and so forth, imitating the culture of our ancestors and ancestors. But... So Tekanu is a replication of what we first discover. When you first discover your shadow as a child and going into adulthood and so forth, and you begin to see the relationship between the length of the shadow and the movement of the sun, the length or the shortness of the shadow in relation to the movement of the sun, and then we see natural features of creation, mountains and trees and so forth, and the length of their shadows in relationship to the movement and the position of the sun and so forth, we began to recognize that as a system of measurement. So when we built these great Tekanu and so forth, then we began to utilize these uh, stationary objects as a form of a time-keeping device. And we made marks on the ground with regard to the length of those shadows. And as I said here, and you can read this in many places, the shortness or the length of the shadows determine the time of day as well as the time of year. So those are the Tekkenu. Then you have the so-called shadow clock 
for Sundial, the first portable timepiece, came into use over 3,500 years ago in ancient Kemet, measuring the passage of hours. This device divided a sunlit day into 10 parts plus two twilight hours in the morning and evening. That's the 12 hours of the day. Of course, you have the 12 hours of the night when the long stem with five variably spaced marks was oriented east and west in the morning and elevated crossbar on the east and cast a moving shadow over the mark. At noon, the device was turned in the opposite direction to measure the afternoon, quote-unquote, hours. And then we talk about the Merket, the oldest known astronomical tool was an Egyptian or Kometi development in around 600 B.C., about 2,600 years ago. Two Merkets were used to establish a north-south line by lining them up with the pole star. They could then be used to mark off nighttime hours by determining when certain other stars crossed the meridian. In the quest for more year-round accuracy, sundials evolved from flat, horizontal, or vertical plates to forms that were more elaborate. And then they talk about one of the versions was a hemispherical uh, dial, a bowl-shaped depression cut into a block of stone that carried a cervical, uh, certain vertical gnomon, a, a pointer scribed with sets of hour lines and so forth. So these are different clocks associated with the movement of the sun. The image that we use for the show, however, is a water clock. They call it a clepsydra, but this is a water clock from ancient Kemet, and this is one we want to talk about. Among the earliest timekeepers that did not depend on the observation of celestial bodies, one of the oldest water clocks was found in the tomb of Amenhotep I, who was buried around, uh, quote-unquote, 1500 B.C., about 3,500 years ago. Now, stone vessels, you see the image is a stone vessel with sloping sides that allowed water to drip at nearly a constant rate from a small hole near the bottom. Then you have other water clocks where cylindrical or bowl-shaped containers designed to slowly fill with water coming in at a constant rate. Markings on the inside surfaces measured the passage of hours as the water level reached them. These clocks were used to determine hours at night, also used for daytime, daylight as well. Another version consisted of a metal bowl with a hole in the bottom. The bowl would fill and sink in a certain time when placed in a container of water. These water clocks are still in use in North Akuraka, North Africa today. So we've been using these clocks for over 3,000 years, 3,500 years, 4,000 years, and so forth. Some dealing with the sun, but we wanted to deal with this water clock. And the reason for that is when we look at the, uh, first and foremost, the spelling of the name of this divinity. When you look at Wunut, or Wunut, this female divinity, you see the hair rising up out of the uh, symbol for the water line. So let's go to our book, Etchy Sign, Ancestry Religious Reversion uh, publication from 13,016. And you, go, you can go to the Nhoma page and, and download this document. You want to go to page, hold on one second. Let me get to the correct page. All right. That page will be page 18. So in this particular uh, article in the book, we were talking about the names of the various traditions that we were dealing with at the Etchy Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference. And, of course, we have our third annual Etchy Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference coming up um, at the end of March. Uh, March 24th, 25th, here in Washington, D.C. Um, and what we, what we deal with is reversion. We don't deal with conversion. You only convert someone to a pseudo-religious practice that otherwise they would not be involved in. Fake religion requires re, uh, conversion. 
what we talk about is reversion or returning to our original pristine state, that ritual practice that's written into our nature, into our ka, kaet, soul, divine consciousness, okra, okra, by the supreme being, pre-incarnation. So we come into the world assigned to specific deities, assigned to specific ancestral blood circles, and therefore we are born into the world with a culture and ancestral religion. So we're talking about ancestral religious reversion. And we have different uh, individuals speaking on different manifestations of our ancestral religious practices here in the Western Hemisphere. Hoodoo, which is the Akan tradition in North America, Voodoo, which is the Ebe and Phone tradition in North America, uh, Juju, which is the Yoruba tradition in North America, Wanga, which is the Obambo tradition in North America, and Gengan, which is the uh, Fang tradition in North America, Grigri, which is the Bambara tradition in North America, and so forth. So in this particular article, in this first volume, we were talking about the origins of the names of these traditions as they not only are defined in their languages, but the exact same name can be found in the language of ancient Kemet with the same meanings and cosmological foundation. So we talked about the term kudu, coming from the term undu, in Akan, meaning root medicine from roots, trees, plant life, and so forth, root work, and so forth. It also means to become heavy with the spirit. Undu means medicine from plants, trees, you know, plant life, and so forth. It also means to become heavy with the spirit in the Medutu, in the language of Kemet, the hieroglyphs of Kemet. Spell that out. The term Vodun or Voodoo from the phone and Ebe languages and so forth, we go into detail here and we show that Vodun or Wondun or Wunu comes from the term Wonu, this divinity Wunu to Wunu in ancient Kemet. There's a male and female hair divinity. So we go into detail about that. We're going to talk a little bit about that from this article, but then we want to focus on synchronized events. But in the phone language, vo means to rest, and dune means to draw water. The phone people describe how young women who are tasked to carry vessels of water from the river back to the village must first walk down to the river and then draw water. The vessel is filled with water and then placed upon the head. The individual then walks back to the village with the water. The individual must perfectly balance the water vessel upon the head so that it is not wasted. The individual must therefore rest to become, become composed, balanced, and then draw the water, doom. This expression is on a mundane level. On a spiritual level, the water is the gateway to the spirit realm. And, of course, those of us who engage in that ritual practice of water divination, we, we deal with that in, in real time. We first rest, vo, become still, and then draw water doom, into the spirit realm, quote-unquote, go under, and become possessed by the Vodun or Kuvita, the deities and spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. Also related to the method of divination, commonly called water gazing upon possession, the spirit alights upon the head of the individual. The individual must be balanced in order to carry the spirit properly and function as a fitting vessel for the spirit to speak through in order to heal, guide, empower, and protect the community. The term Vodou references the deities, the divine spirit forces that animate creation, while the term Vodun or Voodoo is a descriptive of the ancestral religion itself. Yet, Vodou or Voodoo is used as a noun and a verb. The origins can be found in the language of ancient Kanid and Kemet. And this is where we get the image of the hair, deity, there's a male deity as well as a female deity. When we're talking about the female deity tonight as she births and synchronizes life events, um, we get this hair divinity that we're talking about. The term tune or dune in Kemet means rising, flood, inundation. It also means to rise up, lift up, raise up. The Medutu, the hieroglyphs show a hair above the wavy water line, Medut hieroglyph, as well as the Medutu, the hieroglyphs for a pool of water, lake, and urns which carry water. So we show that term, dune, and we show the rising flood inundation, the hair rising up out of the water. Now, unlike rabbits, hares can actually swim. What's important about the symbol of the hair and the term dune is its function 
in the related terms. So dun, you also have undun or wundun or wunun, which means things which are things which exist. Existence, being existence. Unun or wunun, it also means to rise up, to leap up and so forth. The term un or unun not only means existence, but also to leap up, rise up. The hair is rising up or leaping up out of the water. This is related to the emerging of the sun from the primordial waters at the beginning of creation. It is also related to the rising up of a spirit from the spirit realm to appear in the physical world. At the beginning of creation, this, the primordial black waters and so forth, when Nun and Nunet give birth to Ra and Ra, the divine fire and light of creation that explode from the blackness, they rise up out of the, the primordial black waters to manifest the first fire and light in creation, beginning to spiral through the black substance of space, carving out black spheres that become the first black bodies. The energy of Ra and Ra penetrate those first black spheres and illuminate them. Those become the first stars and so forth, radiating. And, of course, the planets are born from that. So we're talking about the rising up of the creator and creatress out of the primordial black still water. At the beginning of the day, and then you see the sun, quote, unquote, rise up out of the primordial darkness in the eastern hemisphere or horizon, rising up in the east and so forth, you have that same process. It's a manifestation of existence. You have the primordial nothingness or nothingness. And then the first explosion of action and activity, the fire and light, is the first manifestation of so-called existence. So unun means existence, that which exists, but it also means to leap up, to rise up. And the hair is rising up or leaping up out of the primordial water. Now, unun means to reject, to turn back, as well as to open, as well as to attack, to stab. We have these different terminologies or definitions of this term, and we show those, and we're going to get into that. As we can see, unun means existence, the title of male and female deities. Unun also means our time, regular duty, service. Moreover, there are a class of priests and priestesses called unun and unut, which are the priests and priestesses who are our priests, lay servants of a temple, and so forth. They're regulating hours, giving offerings to the divinities at the certain and right times. They are synchronizing activities. Wunun and Wunut, these priests and priestesses of the hours and so forth of the times, they are synchronizing life events to affect uh, life events for the people, for those who come to them as, just the na- as well as the nation itself. Now, we get some etymological information, linguistic information showing that the U is also the W, just like in Wanga. In the Bantu term, Wanga is also pronounced Vanga, depending on the Bantu ethnic group. Ewe with the W is also pronounced Eze, depending on the dialect spoken by the people. So you have Unu, which is Wonu, in Coptic is Wonu. And Wonun becomes Wonun or Vodun. In Fon and Egbe, it comes from Wonun or Wonun in ancient Kemet. And we're showing this primordial hair rising up out of the water to rest and draw water. It's important to note the relationship of the word Dun with the hair in the couchant position. You see the hair couched by the water, resting upon the water and so forth, and the hair rising up. Doom meaning to rise up or leap up out of the water. So you see the hair couches, but then the hair also rises up. That's important to note the relationship of those two terms and the various expressions of unun or wonun, meaning the hair rising up out of the water. So we go into some detail about that linguistically, just um, showing that then there's another version of the term wonun, Wunun with the G at the end, the nasal becomes a hard nasal, so Wunun becomes Wununga and Wununga or Wununga. That's another 
um, definition of that in ancient Kemet. And when you look at that particular um, uh, spelling, Wunun becomes Wunungo, and that's defined, shown once again as the hair above the waterline and so forth. On the male side, there's a deity. On the female side, it's a divinity. Onung becomes Onungo, a son of Ra who bore the heavens on his shoulders. That's the title of that divinity. Onungo becomes Onongo or Adonko in Akan and Adonko, male Adonkowa, female, comes from Odunko in ancient Kemet. Onunko, a title of that divinity, a variation of the name. That's the name for the hair, the male and female hair in the Akan language. Onunko, it comes from Onun or Wonun in ancient Kemet. That becomes Wonun or Vodun in, um, in the Fon Ebe languages. The Adanko hair, Adankawa, the female hair in the Akan tradition are healers and healers, as priests and priestesses and so forth the ones who give the undu, the medicine, the hoodoo, and so forth, as we talked about in that broadcast when we talked about the origin of the rabbit's foot in hoodoo. So, so we wanted to, on one hand, show that, that etymological origin so you can see that the hair is rising up out of the water. But it's also related to this notion of time. So let's look at these notion of synchronized events based on the definition of un or ununun or wonun and so forth. So when you look at the terms, we also already said it means existence, ununun. It also means to leap or to rise up, ununun. And then we talked about existence, the primordial existence, the first manifestation of the creator and creatress, the first manifestation of existence, as opposed to subsistence in the primordial no thingness, the primordial inert waters, but the existence, the external manifestation is the rising up or the manifestation of the first fire and light, the leaping up, which is rod and riot, and of course the hair swims in the primordial waters and leaps up. That hair is known for its fecundity, meaning it has the capacity, the hair has the capacity to have a number of, of offspring very rapidly and so forth. So the one that rises up or leaps up out of the primordial waters is the one that gives birth to a number of children and so forth, akin to rod and riot, the creator and creator trust leaping up out of the water through the first primordial sun, Aten or Atenit, and then giving birth to many, many, many children and so forth in creation. So those definitions of Unun for existence, Unun for leaping up, rising up, directly related. Things with, which exist, Unun, Unun, Ununi can mean a man or, or woman, meaning one who exists. Now, Let's get into some further definitions of the same term. To reject, to turn back, to turn aside, it also means to lift, like to spring up to, or to lift up, also meaning to lift a hand, meaning to help, a helping hand or a lifting hand. Unun, to lift, to rise up, to spring up, but also a helping hand, to lift, a lifting hand. So you have a lifting hand to help, to assist, to journey, to course, to reject, to turn back, unun. Then you also have a chamber or a sanctuary. Unun also means to open, an opener, a piercer, the openers, the door openers. Unun, ro, one who opens, performs the ceremony of the opening of the mouth, becomes a title of priests, as well as different divinities. Un or unun her means to open oneself. And then you have the various terms, unun, dealing with the hours, times of day, hourly service, time, regular duty, hourly service, and then priests and priestesses of this regular service. And unun, the divinity, unun, or unun gives her title to these priests and priestesses as well as the divinities of the hours the divinities of the regulated time, the divinities of the secret, synchronized time. So when you have synchronized life events, these deities are participating in how these events manifest or birth within these uh, units of time or these hours. Even the term unit comes from unun and so forth. But what is the relationship? Unun meaning to lift a hand or to help, to reject, to turn back, to set aside, 
to open openers, door openers, to manifest, to show oneself and so forth, to open the mouth, to open to free from fetters and so forth. When you're going through specific events in life and you feel and recognize that the ancestresses and ancestors, the nananom, insamampo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, and the abosom, the divinities, have put certain people in your path so you could come in contact with them, so they can answer a question or give you confirmation of something physically that you received at the ancestral shrine or through ritual practice spiritually, then physically they put someone in front of you or put you in the midst of a circumstance that verifies what you receive physically, uh, spiritually. It is verified in the physical world so that you can be confident in that confirmation. And, of course, we're dealing with the way you uh, – by this is through ritual practice and communication and developing a relationship with your nananoman samaf, your spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, as well as the abosom, the deities connected to you. When you develop that kind of relationship, then they have a specific means by which they work with you to give confirmations, and they give those same kinds of confirmations in the same kinds of ways on a regular basis. If you're not developing a relationship with your own direct blood circle ancestresses and ancestors, and just go get readings from people or, you know, try to read up on some information and so forth, you can have discarnate spirits, relatives, and non-relatives, including those who are not spiritually cultivated, even those who are criminal, trying to influence you in one way or the other, and then you assume that once you get some kind of information or some kind of message from a discarnate spirit, it must be a confirmation of something, and then you go ahead and, you know, engage some kind of behavior based on that message, and it's uh, self-destructive. You don't want to, of course, follow criminal individuals in life when they make their transition. You don't follow the same criminal individuals when they make their transition. So the way that we get confirmation is first and foremost developing a relationship on a consistent basis with our ancestresses and ancestors who are spiritually cultivated. And then when they give confirmations, they, will, they have a pattern, a manner in which they give such confirmations. This is why the term unun meaning to help, first meaning existence, to leap up, to rise up, also meaning to a lifting or a rising hand, the for a helping when they're synchronizing events. That's why unun means a helping or rising hand. Unun means to reject, to turn back, to set aside. There are certain things that they're assisting you with, rejecting or turning aside or pushing back so you don't fall into disorder. They're synchronizing life events for you, putting you in the right place at the right time so you don't make bad decisions so you can repel or reject Unun, the right individuals or events or circumstances so you can be on the right track. It also means to open, to open fetters, to the openers, pierces even, the title of a priest is a slayer of a sacrificial animal and so forth. They're opening the way for you, unun, to open the way for you, unun, lifting a helping hand and so forth, unun, to reject, to turn back, to turn aside. They're opening the way for you, connecting you with other individuals or events to confirm what they told you spiritually in a physical way. Uh, fashion, but they're also helping you to repel disorder, repel, reject, turn back, turn aside, disordered individuals, entities, as well as activity. It also, of course, has to do with hour, time, regular service, and so forth. So when you see these different definitions, some people wouldn't understand the, re the relationship between unun, meaning existence, Unun meaning to leap or rise up. What does leaping and rising up have to do with just existence? Of course, when the child is born, they're quote unquote leaping up or rising, or being birthed from the womb, coming from the watery region. The amniotic fluid breaks and the child rises out of that and so forth, rises up, is drawn out of the womb and so forth, drawn out of the water, vodun to rest and draw water and so forth. Existence, the manifestation of Ron Riot in the physical realm, after the period of no thingness and so forth, unu meaning existence, but then leaping up at the same time, and also a helping hand, a lifting hand, a raising hand to reject, to return, 
to uh, push back and so forth for protection, also to open the way, open fetters, release chains or bondage upon you so you can be free to operate in a harmonious fashion and in harmony with the direction that the Abosom and Insomoth will give you to show oneself all these different definitions are cosmologically related. All these definitions of unum are cosmologically related. But then we have this notion of the hours, the time, the synchronized events. So to give an example of a synchronized event, and it manifests in various different ways. For example, we'll give an example of something that's not based specifically on an hour per se, that in the way that most people would think about it, but in a sense, it really is. And these abosom, these forces in nature, these unun or wunun um, divinities, these hourly divinities synchronizing time and events and people and places and things all at the right point so that we can receive a message or a confirmation of a message. This is what took place. So we, a number of years ago, we were applying for a position at a human services agency in another state after a number of months of having just simply submitted a resume online. A number of months later, we got a call. They said, can you come in for an interview? So I flew out to, that, to the region um, for the interview, we came one evening, went the next day for the interview, and actually had my luggage because I had the flight to go back, you know, home right after the interview, so I brought the luggage in there to the event and so forth, but they knew I was flying in. So I fly into this, come to this interview. Of course, I don't know anybody in this particular state, in this area. I'm just coming in for this human resources position that I happen to hear about this agency that I've never heard before. I found them online and so forth, a black-owned agency. So I just simply sent the resume, came out, there were five individuals, a couple of supervisors, the director of the program, the director of human resources, and another re human resources uh, assistant director and so forth were all sitting there at the table when I arrived, fielded questions from all of the individuals. So as I'm sitting there, I'm trying to determine whether or not the messages I was given from the Nsamampo, the Nananoma Nsamampo, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, making sure I say what I need to say, trying to determine was this the proper uh, position to even apply for and fly out to this state, this region, to interview for this position. And as they're asking me different questions about my experience working in the field of human services and so forth, and as we we're talking about certain things, and I talked about drug prevention and have, how we had a cultural approach to dealing with drug prevention in, in the Chicago area and so forth. They asked for an example of what we were talking about, and when you look in our book, uh, Kwamua Whole Life Journal, there's one section dealing with a seven-part definition of melanin and how uh, being black, that melanin content, what it really actually means, inclusive of how certain uh, various drugs cause our people, because we're melanin dominant, to become hooked quicker and stay hooked longer because once the chemicals get into our system, they bind to the melanin mo molecule, creates a hybrid molecule and so forth, and we get hooked quicker and stay hooked longer. But all the great things that melanin does has electromagnetic properties and so forth. It's found in the hair, the skin, eyes, plant life, animal life, mineral life, of course, the black substance of space, oceans, rivers, uh, all throughout creation and so forth, helps to heal the body. Uh, the melanin content is part of that natural Band-Aid that forms on your body when you have a cut, and the natural Band-Aid is a scab. The melanin helps to clot the blood and stop the bleeding and forms a natural Band-Aid, the black Band-Aid, which is a scab full of melanin to help, you know, keep the wound, wound uh, clean as it's you know, uh, healing and so forth. So a number of different things um, we were talking about with regard to melanin. So they appreciated that. They, that was just an example of the way we have a cultural approach to dealing with uh, drug prevention. We don't just talk about cocaine and heroin and marijuana and alcohol and what they do to the body, but also what they do to the melanin-dominant body. 
how these drugs were introduced to our communities because they understood how destructive they are to the melanin-dominant body and so forth. So we have that information in the Mkwamua Whole Life Journal. But that was just one example. But we were just talking about my experience working with youth in drug prevention and so forth. And as they are going around the different five individuals asking different questions about experience or, um, you know, what things I'm interested in with regard to human services and things like that, one of the supervisors there who eventually became one of my supervisors, it was time for her to ask a question. And the question she asked was, well, I have a question. This is a little bit off topic, but are you an Akan priest? Now, I said, no, I'm not. And then she said, okay, I just, I just wanted to ask that. And then they continued along with the interview. Now, at that particular moment, of course, I knew that I had the job. At that moment, I knew that when my insomnia directed me to apply for this job in this different state, this different region, uh, at this particular black-owned agency, because there was more than one black-owned agency and so, so forth, this was a physical confirmation. Of course, I ended up getting the job and working there. A number of months later, that particular supervisor, which is a, um, it turns out that she was an Akan priestess in training. A number of months later, she was one of my supervisors, but she ended up leaving the agency. If I had applied uh, a few months later, then I would have never, she would have never been sitting on the panel to interview me to ask me if I'm Akan priest. Now, the other people in the agency, they're not involved in ancestral religion, so they didn't know what she was talking about. They had no clue. Of course, when I walked in the room, her being um, someone going through that initiatory process, someone who's receptive, someone who, who has a shrine, someone who communicates with her nanonoma and samanfo, communicates with the abosom and so forth, as soon as I showed up and saw her and we saw one another, her and samanfo let her know who I am because we're connected, of course. So the other people didn't know, but she did. Typically when you're having an interview for any job, typically people don't ask you if you're an Akan priest. But, of course, that was one of those synchronized events, that the Nsamam folk put me in the right place at the right time, put her in the right place at the right time to confirm, yes, when you communicated with us, your Akan ancestresses and ancestors, yes, we want to make sure that you understood that this was the place we wanted you to come to because this is the place that you were going to be working at and we knew that the previous year or at least six months before. So that's just one of those examples of a synchronized event. Another example of a synchronized event, on the other side, I was working at a cultural uh, business in the Chicago area a number of years ago, working in the store and so forth, somebody came across the, from across the street. He walked in. He said, I just wanted to know if you all had any quarters because I don't have any quarters and I'm standing in this building for a couple of days for my job across the street in this high rise and I need to wash some clothes. And I wonder if your business has some quarters, if you have any extra that I could, you know, get so I can use for the washing machines and so forth. And I exchanged the money for him, and then he asked me what my name is, and I said, Kwesi. Very often I would say Ra Nehem or Ra, but at that, that particular day I said Kwesi. And then he started asking me, what does the name Kwesi mean? I recognized he had an accent. Then he told me he was from Ghana. Then he started asking me, what does Kwesi mean? And I told him, First, he asked me, did I know what that name meant? He just assumed I was a, one of the African-Americans who just took on a, a name and just didn't know what it meant. Then he asked me what it meant. I told him what it meant. Then he asked me some other questions. Then he started asking me questions about every day of the week and the names of the different male and females of each day of the week and so forth. And I gave him detailed information about that. And he was very surprised. And then he wrote his name down and wrote down his phone number. And he said he's from Ghana and he's just here working for a little while. But when he goes back, if there's any time I wanted to come and travel to Ghana, then I could stay with his family and he would show us around and show me around and everything else. And his last name was Boaso. And Boa 
in our economy, the assistant or helper, and Boako is one of the people who assists or helps and so forth. On his side, when he looks, at, looks back at that experience, if he had not been working at that particular building for a couple of days, if they had sent him to a different high-rise, and he didn't see that store right across, directly across the street from his building, because right next door to us in the same building was a grocery store. He could have just went a few feet over and went to the grocery store and got some quarters directly from them. But he came into this shop directly across the street from the place he was staying, asked for some quarters, and then got some detailed information about the Akradin, um, the soul names and so forth, from somebody he was not expecting. That was a synchronized event. He walked away with more knowledge of his own culture from somebody he wouldn't have expected to have it w without even um, recognizing. That's another manifestation of a synchronized event. One other quick one that we talked about before with regard to Etchi Sign, we just read from the Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion book, Volume 1, which we released in March um, on the day of our uh, first annual Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference. What was interesting about that particular day in March, we had it around the spring equinox on that particular Sunday. Number one, it was supposed to snow that day. Some people were saying they weren't going to be able to come out because it was supposed to snow and everything that was going to happen. What ended up happening, of course, was right the, the, the uh, forecast was for snow all night. They were telling people they shouldn't come out and drive and so forth because the roads are going to be uh, nasty, and they were warning people and so forth. What ended up happening was it did begin to snow at night, but then the temperature changed in the morning and right around the time that it was time for people to start coming out to the event, it started warming up and the snow melted, everything worked out. But the key was on that particular day, something was happening that hadn't happened in over 60 years in Washington, D.C. Now, when we talk about Ojira Mind, the purified nation, Akurakani, Afrikani people in the Western Hemisphere, the Achinebwa, or animal totem, for Ojira Mind, the purified nation that, we, that you see on our website and so forth, is the Okore, which is the eagle. That bird is sacred to our set and, and different divinities and so forth, but that's the sacred Achinebwa eagle for Ojira Mind, the purified nation. We were having our first annual Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, and it turned out that that week, there, were, uh, there was an eagle cam um, in a specific area of Washington, D.C., because for the first months prior, for the first time in 60 years, two eagles had nested in the Washington, D.C. region. And those two eagles had nested, and this was the first birth of eaglets in 60 years. And one of them was born, and they had a 24-hour eagle cam, and people were watching uh, all over, from all over the country and different parts of the world, waiting for the second eaglet to hatch. And they thought it was going to happen on that Saturday night, and they were watching, and people had the cam on, and schools in the area were watching from the eagle cam and so forth. And what ended up happening was the morning of our event, just a couple of hours before our event started, the eagle, the second little eaglet hatched. That was the inauguration of Ojiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. This was our first annual Echi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference. So at the hours that it was supposed to be snowing and causing a great deal of problems and people weren't going to make it to the event, the weather broke, the sun came out, the snow melted, the eaglet hatched for the first time in 60 years, the same symbol that represents our nation, and we had our first an an annual Etchi Sign conference, and it was well attended. And this, of course, was the first time that we had Hudu, the Akan ancestral religion, Juju, the Yoruba ancestral religion, um, um, Wanga, the Ovambo ancestral religion, um, Ngangai, the Fang ancestral religion in North America, these different traditions all coming together, dealing with ancestral religious reversion. But this synchronization of events 
the first time in 60 years that the eaglets hatched and or eagles nested in the D.C. region and then the second eaglet hatching on the morning of our Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, the animal totem for our nation manifesting for the first time at the time of our first conference that was a synchronization of events governed by the Abosong. Five months prior to that was our first annual Hoodoo Mine, Hoodoo Nation Festival. And we're dealing with Hoodoo, the Akan ancestral religion in North America, specifically. Etchi is dealing with the various traditions, but the Hoodoo Mine, Hoodoo Nation Festival deals specifically with Hoodoo, which is the Akan ancestral religion in North America, in that particular tradition and in that symbolism for the Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival, we have the symbol of the Kwa Kwa Dabi, which is the crow, also the uh, raven, but specifically here the, um, the white crested raven on the continent, but the raven here in North America. Once again, this was the first time in over 90 years that ravens nested in Washington, D.C. They nested in Washington, D.C., right around the time that we had our first annual Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival here in Washington, D.C., the same place that the Ravens first nested for the first time in 90 years. Five months later, we had our first annual Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, the manifestation of the eaglet being born, the first time eagles nested in Washington, D.C. in 60 years. So these were synchronized events. We were not planning the events at the time, but the Insamanfo told us to have the events at the time that we had them. So we scheduled the Hoodoo Mind Festival uh, the, on October 17th, and then we had the Etchi Sign Festival or conference March 19th and so forth. These are synch this synchronization of events. This is what, this is just different manifestations of the various, if you imagine the various machinations that have to be engaged for different people and different events and different animals to all come together, animals and so forth, all to come together to manifest at a specific time just to give you that confirmation or confirmatory message. This is how Wunut, the hair divinity, who's the one who births uh, the hours, the divinities of, of the various hours, the Unut and Unutiu divinities, She's the one who's very, very fertile and so, so forth, the divine hair swimming through the primordial water, manifesting and leaping up out of the water and so forth, like the sun leaping up out of the water, very fecund, very fertile, giving birth to many, many children, but also giving birth to these many, many synchronized events that we can uh, characterize and align our life activities with. There's also another piece in relation to that, in relationship to that, dealing specifically with relationships, and we did a specific uh, publication on this. We did a five or four-part series with a couple of um, addendums on the female divinity, Bast divinity, and so forth. But there was one specific uh, part four where we talked about the divination of affection. And there's one portion of that document, and you can look at that. We'll put the link in the chat room real quick from our WordPress site. We did a broadcast on that. Hold on one second. We'll put that link in there. We did a broadcast on this. Um, a while back when we went over the entire four-part series. We just wanted to uh, touch on this real quick because there's a direct relationship here. Par for the divination of affection. We did a post on, on Facebook saying synchronicity of events sometimes deals with a, is not always dealing with a marriage relationship sometimes is dealing with a karmic relationship. So sometimes you have a very unique or very meticulous 
synchronization of events, various life issues and events that come together, that unusual events, unusual happenings, unusual circumstances that all bear a signature that binds two people together, two people who don't know each other. We have, you know, numerous examples of this person um, engaged in certain activities on a certain day at a certain time, another person engaged in these same activities at a certain day and a certain time. They don't know each other. These events come together, and it's a very unusual synchronization of events. Sometimes that is uh, evidence of a relationship, a marriage relationship, meaning these two people uh, have been drawn together through these events because they belong together. They are born to be together, so they should engage the marriage process. But then sometimes you have these events that are very, very meticulously drawn together, synchronized in a very powerful fashion, but they're really dealing with a karmic relationship Maybe you had um, relations in the past. Maybe you were brother and sister in the past or cousins in the past. Maybe you were married in the past in a previous existence and so forth. But these events are synchronized, not because you need to be married in this particular uh, existence. Maybe you need to simply work together on a major project that will benefit the Akurakani Afrikani community or a series of projects, and you need to be together for that. You need to be built together for that for a number of years or even the rest of your lives and so forth. Sometimes because of the way we uh, operate in the West, we're not involved in ancestral culture and religion, so the first time we have any kind of spiritual experience or some unique you know, confluence of events that draws us together with another individual, our immediate assumption is, okay, this person must be my future spouse. But that's not always the case. And sometimes people who are engaged in some aspect of spiritual culture or something spiritual, and they've left Christianity, Islam, the fake religions alone, and so forth, but they've been influenced by some New Age misinformation, talking about spirit guides and other things, and not rooted in ancestresses and ancestors of your direct spirit genetic blood circle who have been assigned to you by the Supreme Being to guide you throughout your, the course of your life connected to specific Patroclan Abosom, Matroclan Abosom, Patroclan deities, Matroclan deities that govern you and have governed you for thousands of years, not just some, you know, amorphous, um, misguided notion of quote-unquote spirit guides. The whites and their offspring talk about spirit guides because they don't have spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors who are assigned to them to assist them in their divine function because they don't have a divine function. They don't have a class of spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors because they are spirits of disorder. So they don't have what we have. So when they talk about spirit guides, they just get direction from any disembodied spirit. But that's not our culture. We're not inferior like they are. We don't engage just any kind of spirit just pulling us in different directions. We don't embrace spiritually degenerate, spiritually disordered, discorded entities trying to get them to do work for us. That's silly. That's nonsensical. That's idiotic. You deal with the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of your direct spirit genetic blood circle only for guidance. You don't deal with anybody who's not related to you. You don't, of course, the whites and their offspring, and you don't deal with spirits of disorder, even if they're black who are engaged in criminality and self-destructive behavior and so forth, and they made their transition You don't evoke those individuals for direction. That's foolish. That's self-destructive. The only kind of people who engage in that are the same kind of people who engage in lustful, addictive, self-destructive behaviors in the world, people who smoke and drink and uh, promiscuous and so forth and rationalize stupidity and rationalize self-destructive behavior. They will rationalize that kind of behavior, and they will seek lustful activities from discarnate spirits of relatives and non-relatives, even people who were of different races, brainwashed black people trying to evoke and conjure up the spirits of deceased crackers and to, quote, unquote, do work for them. That is pure stupidity. That comes from the white and their offspring. That has no basis in reality. So we deal with our spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors, 
they are connected to the Petra clan and Matra clan, are both some divinities that are connected to us. And through their synchronization of events, they're connected to those children of Unut, those Unut divinities, those our divinities, those divinities of regularity, period, those ones who synchronize events by the various quote-unquote out. Now, in this piece by talking about Bass, part number four, And we want to get down to this specific uh, section. It's a little bit further down. Hold on one second. Okay, so we're talking about uh, Het Heru and Bast, attraction and affection initiation and perpetuation of a complementary relationship on the cool, energetic, magnetic side is foundational to balance, the divine balance of my on my The fanning of the flames of the Ba, the Ba is the divine living spirit within you, increasing the fire within us can manifest as harmonious aggression, the precursor to righteous warfare, or harmonious arousal. So when we said the Ba and Ba'at, the Ba is the divine living spirit in the male. The Ba'at is the divine living spirit in the female. It's shown in the Medusa, the hieroglyphs of the bird, sometimes a bird with a bowl of burning incense, showing that it's a fire, a burning bowl of incense that's animated, the bird with the wings, and animating fire within you, the Ba, the Ba'at, the divine living energy circulating within your spirit body, your energy link to the divine living energy of the Creator and Creator Trust. So Het Heru fuses together complementary opposites. That's attraction. So that conception can take place so people can come into existence and so forth. She also fuses together complementary opposites in the form of music and art and colors and shapes and movements and sounds and so forth. So she governs that. That attraction leading to complementary fusion governed by Het Heru. She fuses together the Afrakani male and Afrakani female, that central attraction, the precursor to procreative activity. She fuses together complementary opposites, that attraction. Then Bass is the perpetuation of that initial ordered fusion, a complementary fusion. She perpetuates that. She's dealing with affect, <coughs> affection. Ederu is dealing with that attraction. Bass is dealing with that affection, which is the perpetuation of that complementary fusion. And when you can perpetuate that fusion, that beauty manifests through the fusion of complementary opposites through Het Heru, that affection can facilitate the continuity of your relationship. Now, so we said Het Heru and Bath, attraction and affection, initiation and perpetuation. Initiation is Het Heru, perpetuation is bad. Attraction, Het Heru, perpetuation or affection Bass. So when we said Heteru and Bass, the attraction and affection, the initiation and perpetuation of a complementary relationship, foundation to balance, the fanning of the flames of the Ba, the Ba is the divine living energy within you, increasing the fire within you so you can fan the flames of that divine living energy within you, it increases your fire. You can fire yourself up. Your living energy circulating within you, you can fan the flames of that fire through Het Heru and Bass, and it can expression that fire, the precursor to a righteous warfare. You can get fired up, so you can wage war against the enemy, but you can also become fired up. That's harmonious aggression, precursor to a righteous warfare, waging war against the enemy to kill the enemy to preserve your clan. But then it can also be harmonious arousal. Fire can be for aggression. Fire can be for harmonious arousal. When the fanning of the flames of the Ba, the Ba is the divine living spirit, when manifest this harmonious arousal, arousal meaning rising up, leaping up, springing up, that hair springing up out of the primordial water in the form of the primordial Aten, Atenit, the sun, and so forth, manifestation of that primordial fire rising up and exploding, when manifest this harmonious harmonious arousal rising up, the flames of the Ba, by the spirit, provoke the energy of Het Heru for fusion with our complement, 
and provoked the energy of Bast to dispense affection for the perpetuation of that initiatory fusion. So to, to recap that, when you fan the flames of your divine living energy, the life force energy within you, and there's an expression or expansion of that fire, if it's for harmonious aggression, you use that fire to wage war against the enemy. If it's for harmonious arousal and it manifests as harmonious arousal, that fire you generate within yourself provokes the energy of the deity, the goddess Het Heru. And when it provokes her energy, she responds by engaging that fusion, that complementary fusion that helps you fuse with your complement, your divine complement, who will become your spouse. So you provoke the energy of the divinity who has the responsibility to show you who your natural complement is. So you're, you fan the flames of the fire of your spirit. You prov- it's projected from you to the divinity, Heda Rush. It provokes her energy. She dispenses that complementary fusion, that attractive energy, and so forth, so you can be drawn to your complement. The standing of the flames of your life force energy also provokes the energy of Bast, the cat divinity, so she can dispense her energy of affection. Hedaru dispenses the energy of attraction, so you can be drawn to your divine complement. Hedaru dispenses the energy of affection for the perpetuation of that initial attraction. You don't want to just get attracted and have a quote-unquote one-night stand, so to speak, and it's over. You have attraction, but then the perpetuation of that attraction is affection. That's how that attraction is perpetuated through bad. It perpetuates the initiatory fusion. So that's when it's a harmonious arousal of the fire within you, provoking these two divinities for attraction and affection, fusion and the perpetuation of that fusion. However, sometimes arousal is not harmonious. Harmonious arousal is predicated upon the individual following the direction of his or her ka or ka soul divine consciousness, the okra, okra, the order you know, and so forth. The deity dwelling in the head region inscribed within that divinity is your functioning creation and so forth given to you by the supreme being. So you follow that divinity to pull in your head towards thoughts, intentions, and actions that are in harmony with divine order and so forth. Now, while the Akurakani Akurakani man and woman complement one another, there are specific Akurakani men and specific Akurakani women who directly complement one another while they do not directly complement others. Certain cells are divine to work closely together, while others, although part of the entire body as a whole, do not work as closely together by virtue of their divine function. When we attune to our ka, kaet, our soul, the deity in the head region, we attune to our divine function and creation and our inherited creative capacity to execute that divine function. We stimulate our ba, by it, our divine living energy, our spirit to energize the divine the design, the plan, the function, that specific design contained within our soul, our ka, kaet, Thus, when we come in contact with our harmonious complement, the person we need to connect with, this stimulation of the energy of the ba, the ba at the divine living energy within us, the fanning of the flames of arousal, is a provocation of Het Heru, who facilitates the fusion with our complement through attraction, and a provocation of Bast, who facilitates affection, the perpetuation of the harmonious fusion. How do we know which individual is a harmonious complement? How do we determine whether or not the arousal we experience is a harmonious arousal or a misguided desire, lust, or conditioning? This is the domain of adebisa, divination. Anytime we inquire of the abosom, the arisha, the vodou, and so forth, or the nananoman, samanfo, egungun, kuvito, the aku, akutu, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, or the deities, anytime we make any kind of inquiry, even if we're just wondering, we're provoking 
these divinities and ancestral spirits just by projecting our thought forms, which are matrices, units, and uh, matrices of energy, provoking them for a response. Any subject, any issue, when we think and provoke those thought forms, we're engaged in oracular in an oracular function. This includes the invocation of our kaakai, our soul, divine consciousness, the personal deity dwelling in the heavens. When inquiring or divining with the kaakai as the soul concerning the focus of our affection, we are, have a focus of our affection. We're inquiring, is this person the harmonious complement that we should be with? Is this the woman we should be with? Or if you're a woman, is this the male you should be with and so forth? That participates in this process. This is one of the reasons we feel a surge of energy in the heart region when we contemplate our harmonious complement. This is the Unjuin Jar of Bath that we showed in the earlier portion, the second part of the uh, series, that Unjuin Jar of Bath, that perfume, oil jar, and so forth, in the body is the pericardium, the heart sac, the fluid-filled heart sac that contains the heart, lubricating the heart, promoting affection, and so forth. That is her Unjuin Jar in your body. So when they show that Bath, the female divinity of uh, affection and so forth has a perfume jar or sacred oil jar and so forth. That is the pericardium, which in which the fluid filled sac that the heart sits in. It protects the heart, but also lubricates the heart and so forth. And you feel her shrine in your body. There's a surge of energy there because you're provoking her when you're seeking to know who is the focus of your affection because she governs affection, which is the perpetuation of harmonious fusion. So we say that's the Unjuanjara Vast, the pericardium, lubricating the heart, promoting affection as the flames of the bother by the spirit of fire as arousal are fanned. This is why we see the individual in the image kneeling before the shrine of Vast and giving ritual offerings. We show a statue of a huge cat of Vast and an individual kneeling before her. He's much smaller than her, um, giving off offerings. We also see that within the votive Sculptures of Bath, sometimes the mummified body shrine of a cat was placed within the cat sculptures of Bath. So if you do x rays of statues of the cat divinities, the manifestations of Bath in ancient Kemet, and we show this in the piece, you'll see a mummified body of a cat inside a statue. It becomes a shrine of that deity, a resonant center wherein the energy of Bath is magnified to a great degree via ritual. And the individual is thus enabled through the magnification of energy to hear, feel, and be guided by that more clearly and effectively. Now, and we show in the different traditions, hoodoo and voodoo and juju and so forth, we deal with animal totems and uh, drying out animals when they make their transition, drying out the bodies as a form of mummification utilized in ritual work and so forth. When does one, when one does not have access to a diviner, consistent invocation of the ka, the kaya, the soul deity, and vast is key to discovering and confirming who is the proper focus of our affection, who is our harmonious complement. We must recall that this information is already encoded within our own ka, kaya, our soul. Already encoded within your ka, or your kaya, your okra, okra, while your soul, divine consciousness, the deity dwelling in the head region, is the knowledge of the individual who is your harmonious complement. It's already been seated within you just by nature of your energy complex, how you are configured. You're naturally complementary to the other individual who's configured in the proper fashion. Just like certain cells in the body are configured in a certain way where they work closely together, in certain organs and glandular structures where other cells in the body, they do, they're part of the same body, but they don't work closely together. Wired within their nature, their structure, are the kinds of cells that they are complementary with as opposed to other cells. Wired within your chi and chiat or chiat is your divine function rooted in your form, that spiritual form you were given by Aminet and Amen. And therefore, by nature of your specific form that's unique to you, 
there is one who is complementary to you, and that's wired within you as well. So when you meet that individual and you provoke your ka or your kayak, then you get that answer directly and fast. It gives you details with regard to that. And then we say, moreover, there is no rush as we make such inquiries. The Abosom and Nananom and Samanfo, the deities and ancestral spirits, will give us confirmation after confirmation throughout the course of everyday life provided via ritual. They will continue to give us confirmations until we are certain of the nature of the affection we are experiencing. Divination and time birth receptivity and receptivity facilitates confidence in this bequeathed knowledge. And it is the responsibility of adults to consistently invoke our own ka, hide our soul, divinity in the head region for direction on all aspects of life as it includes our divine function and creation and how we are to operate. The ka, the ka is our spirit's brain. This consistent, consistent invocation includes who should be the focus of our affection, which ultimately leads to harmonious marriage. So when it's talking about confirmation after confirmation after confirmation, we're talking about the unut, unutio, the deities, the children of the unut divinity, who she gives birth to many children, these forces of nature that govern the hours and so forth, govern time, govern time with regard to synchronized events, periodicity, regularity, and so forth. When we invoke Wunut, we invoke these divinities, her children, and these life events that are synchronized, we're able to identify, is this coming from one of the ancestors and ancestors? Is this a confirmation coming from one of them? Or is some other event synchronized by a discarnate spirit that's not operating in harmony with order? The way you do so is to invoke Wunut, but you're also invoking or evoking the ancestors and ancestors of your direct blood circle invoking the ka, the kaya, so you can identify properly this synchronization of events, of life events, to see who's who, what's what, what's correct, what's harmonious, what's complementary, what's not. Okay, so as a matter of fact, so that's the information we wanted to go over tonight. Um, in that vein, we also want to announce for those who are unaware, we just released this information this, uh, on FIDA on Friday. Uh, as you know, we have our Hapi Merit uh, event retreat coming up, training cultural and ritual retreat coming up this weekend. Um, all events will take place in South Carolina on Edisto Island, one of the Gullah Islands in South Carolina, on Saturday and Sunday. And as a matter of fact, there was one space left for a sister um, wants us to cancel, so the sisters who have the beach house, they have a space. So if the sister, if one sister wants to, uh, you still want to register, you can still do that. Just go to the website, let us know, because there's one space open if you want to share housing to split the expense between about five different people. Um, greatly reduce the housing expense for yourself, and then you can register and, and, and do that. But that's um, this weekend, uh, what we released on FIDA on Friday is the second um, training cultural and ritual retreat event still dealing with Oberima and Obatai, Afrakani womanhood, um, Afrakani manhood, Afrakani womanhood, and so forth. This event is another two-day event retreat. It is on the Memorial Day weekend. It is in going to be in New Orleans in the Treme area, but we also go to the French Quarter and so forth, Congo Square, but Treme, um, where it's going to be at um, May 26th and 27th. So that's the Saturday and Sunday, the Mimenida and Awusida of Memorial Day weekend. We just released the information on FIDA on Friday. We created a new page on our website. We put up an event notification and an uh, event page on Facebook and so forth. Um, we're just going to do, have 25 people register um, for this event. We already have um, a couple of people registered so far. So, um, so 23 spaces left. If you would like to register for that Memorial Day retreat in New Orleans, uh, I'll be conducting the 
the Tasa Satem and the Obedima Afrakani Manhood sessions. Uh, the Tasa Satem is a joint session. The Obedima session is uh, for the brothers and for the sisters, for the Obatai and Afrakani Womanhood uh, session for the sisters. Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau, who is based in New Orleans, she will be conducting that. So we're going to be doing this um, retreat together. We did a presentation together a couple of years ago in New Orleans, a year and a half ago, which was a great event. And we're back together again for the Ka Ka'et retreat. It's called the Ka Ka'et Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo event. We'll be dealing with Afurakani manhood, Afurakani womanhood in the context of ancestral religious practice and nationism, Amaniye nationism, the purification of nationalism. So Ka Ka'et, the soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo in Treme, New Orleans, Memorial Day weekend. We have um, 23 spaces left. You can register on our Ka Ka'et page. All of the information is on the page. Um, hit us up on Facebook or just go to the page directly, and we'll place that link in the chat room. Um, some of the people who were not able to make the event in South Carolina um, that they wanted to, you know, we're looking forward to the next event that we had. So this is why we're having this event in New Orleans on Memorial Day weekend. So, um, okay, so we had a question on the, in the chat room. Hold on one second. The, the question is, is, is there only one person in existence? That's it. Um, individual certain circumstances. You can have, uh, for example, you can have someone who is your harmonious complement. You can have more than one person that uh, balances you to a certain extent, you know, you're, that you're aligned with your energy balances with. But there may be one in particular that is the, that you should be in connection with for optimal reasons. But then you have others who have a very similar energy complex, a few others that have a very similar complex. And when I talk about certain events or circumstances, certain things do happen. Sometimes people get engaged in drug use. Sometimes people get killed in a war or, or some other thing, and the person that would have been your harmonious complement, that specific individual is no longer here. Or, you know, they may be strung out on drugs or, or you know, going through some other thing. And sometimes we can feel that the individual who is our harmonious complement is either not here or um, and we can feel a, some form of, you know, something missing or something has gone on. Or sometimes they've married the wrong individual and they got married and had children and are establishing a great deal of negative karma and so forth for themselves um, and maybe in an abusive relationship and, or a number of different things. A number of different things can happen. But there are other people as well who have a similar energetic complex as well. And you'll be drawn to that, those other individuals or that other individual. Out of that group of other individuals, one of them will be the one that's most, you know, optimal. And your ka or your ka will draw you to that individual. Sometimes the other individual is not paying attention to the spiritual information per se or not focused on that kind of thing. But as long as one of you are, then you'll end up drawing the other one to you or drawing yourself to the under, other individual. The insomnia will draw them or put them in place, put you in position to come in contact with them, synchronizing events through the unutiu, the our divinities and so forth, synchronizing these events so you can connect with the individual. But it is true that sometimes the individual that you would have connected with, something has happened to the individual. Of course, we, we know that in, you know, great detail and great experience, just having gone through enslavement, people we would have been in connection with, we get snatched up and taken to America, and the person we would have married or were about to marry is left on the continent, and we're on ships here in America. That doesn't mean that we can't get married and so forth and have children. Of course, we did that. 
That's the reason we're here now, because we connected with somebody else with a similar energy, you know, complex, and it was a balanced situation. We brought forward ancestors and ancestors and so forth through that union, and we continue to, you know, um, expand. So, yes, it does depend on the situation, but, yes, there can be more than one individual. Okay, so, um, all right, so we're going to um, end the broadcast here. We don't have any other questions. If you have any questions or comments, just send us an email quickly, at gmail.com. We will be back on tomorrow night. We may not do the entire week because we do have our conference coming up, um, you know, and we're preparing certain things for that. So we'll let you know. Um, okay, Yenny, I'll say that. We'll let you know. Um, if we're going to broadcast for the full four days this week or um, not. Also, if you're in the New Orleans area, tomorrow is Mardi Gras, so the uh, masking um, event happens. Sometimes they call these Mardi Gras Indians. But in reality, those masking ceremonies and events were not born of anything that had any thing to do with pseudo-Native Americans. It comes directly from the Kuvita and Egungun ritual practices, the masking of the ancestresses and ancestors of the people who brought those ancestral religions to North America in their blood circles. So when they talk about Egungun societies, sometimes they would say, you know, uh, Oyasunji village is the first people who brought the Egungun uh, to North America, but that's not accurate. In reality, it's been going on in New Orleans for hundreds of years. They're not Mardi Gras Indians. They're Mardi Gras Afurakani, Afurakani, or Mardi Gras Africans, and people are beginning to realize that in reality, all you have to do is showcase or um, show juxtapose, juxtapose images from Kuvita, Fon, and Eve ancestresses and ancestors, and their masking and their... Um, Garb, garments and so forth, and show them juxtaposed to so-called uh, Mardi Gras Indians and the ones who maintain the real tradition, you won't be able to tell the difference between the two, separated by hundreds of years and thousands of miles on the continent here in North America, but we're still engaged in ancestral religion. And Kalinda Laveau, who will be with us at the event Memorial Day, um, she will be masking as she does every year um, tomorrow on Mardi Gras. So if you're in the area, go out and support. So, so yet I say, we thank you for tuning into the broadcast, and Yebe Shabio, we will meet again. That's it.